and we should be able to roll. So I'm a curator at the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan, and my responsibilities are agriculture and the environment. And in anticipation of World Donkey Day, I decided that, that I would devise a test of sorts. And this is visual literacy practices. I know you may hear that it's difficult to distinguish between donkeys and mules. And in fact, the photograph on the left has been described both inaccurately in terms of the time period and the human and the animal that's in that image by, yes, by previous catalogers at the Henry Ford and by catalogers at other institutions. Without going into details, this is purely an exercise in, in uh, seeking these distinctive characteristics. So if you look at these, donkeys or mules, Here's a bit, and not to read it, but some of the distinctions. So a donkey, we asked, well, if you only had them next to each other, you might be able to tell proportions. But donkeys are not all smaller than horses. There are mammoth donkeys, mammoth jacks, but long ears, short hair on the tail, meaning their tail is almost, well, it has no horse mane-like tail or horse tail-like tail. Short, uh, what looks like a roached mane and a dark stripe along the back. And then you might see that there are a few other terms in there that get used for these, these uh, beasts of burden. But then to cut to the chase, the other is the mule, which is the hybrid, the cross between the male donkey and the female horse. Long, shorter ears than the donkey, longer than the horse, tail, hair and a distinctive sound, which most of us in our agricultural museums will not be able to hear unless we have mules on site. So visual literacy, given what you've just had as a very brief overview, just practice. Distinctive characteristics, would you identify that as a mule or a donkey? And this is a self-test. And if you say, Donkey, I would argue you are correct. Mule or donkey, I love this image. It's a man and a boy on a reaper. And yes, you can't see these, this distinctive characteristic because mules often face the camera just like humans do in photographs. So you rarely do you see that tail end. That, those are mules. This fantastic image of working with the sorghum press in Mem near Memphis, Tennessee in 1937, are those two mules or donkeys? And mules. And then there are even some famous individuals in images with mules and donkeys. And I believe, well, you can enhance these images and get closer looks. So you could see the, 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 the heads and the shadows and get a better sense. But I believe mule, 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 or horse at the very end is that donkey, perhaps very used to having his picture taken. This is um, Edsel Ford also right here. That's Henry Ford's son when he's about 22 and on one of those great expeditions to the West as many wealthy and not so many not so wealthy Americans took. Last but not least, if you are uh, auto racing enthusiast, these are the Unser brothers with their burrows, donkeys. Between these two seven time Indianapolis Speedway winners, Indianapolis 500, but very closely entwined as children with their donkeys. So as you think about identification of the artifacts that might be in your collections, here are images the upper left from Australia to the Western US and the Burrow Brigade to the far right, New Orleans, Louisiana, 1909, and a family vacationing also in the Grand Canyon. 
around 1900, it really matters that you identify your, your animal correctly and work towards it because these are, the mule especially is the product of what I call biotechnology, selective breeding, and the creation of a hybrid draft animal. It's uh, rather, well, a, a topic we want to address more, there is a National Mule Day in the United States. And that's in October, so stay tuned for more. But without further ado, what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Paul Starkey's pre-recorded presentation. And I'm gonna to continue to share my screen in the hopes, that, well, all right, I'll stop sharing because it tells me to, and we'll, Let me, let me practice here, or not practice, but get the right screen. And this, yes, we want to share. Hopefully you can now all see Paul's screen and we will go ahead and get it started. Happy World Donkey Day. I am Paul Starkey. I'm a visiting senior research fellow at the Museum of English Rural Life at the University of Reading. And today I'm gonna to be talking about donkeys and mules in the world, their diverse roles, traditions, and some issues. Um, I'll be considering the historical and current role of donkeys in the world and how agricultural museums, research bodies and NGOs can promote relevant issues. I'll be taking an historical perspective, a geographical perspective. I'll be thinking about the roles of donkey, the donkey traditions and key development issues um, and certain ways in which, which we can go forward to promote the use and the um, value of donkeys. I'll be showing photos taken from around the world, over 50 countries, um, and when you're looking at these photos, obviously enjoy them, but also note the numbers of donkeys involved, the people that are using them, men, women, children, the harnessing, the equipment being used, um, so that you're getting a general idea of donkeys in the world for World Donkey Day. So, as you all probably know, mules are created by creating, uh, by crossing a male donkey with a female horse, whereas hinnies are created by crossing a male horse with a female donkey. And hinnies are generally less common and generally smaller than mules. I'll be concentrating on donkeys, but I'll make references to mules as well, because obviously um, mules are bred from donkeys. So taking a very simplistic historical perspective, donkeys were domesticated about 6,000 years ago. And they were used for pack transport in North Africa, Egypt, um, Levant, and in Mesopotamia. They were initially used for meat and milk and pack transport, but they were probably also used for light tillage. They then spread eastwards through pack caravans and southwards across the Sahara into Eastern Africa and West Africa. They didn't get as far as Southern Africa. The Romans took them into Northern Europe and many centuries later, European colonialists took them to the Americas and also to Southern Africa. And the ones in Southern Africa are beginning to meet the ones who, that are coming down from the north um, around Tanzania, um, Kenya. So to give a geographical perspective, um, here are the various photos taken from around Europe. They're actually all showing transport. I should, could have also shown mules weeding between the vines or for, for use for tillage, donkeys and mules. Um, but you can see here used in, in, in different ways for um, pulling carts, uh, for carrying loads and for riding. And one of the interesting parts of, the, um, of, of Europe is the uh, the island of Idra in Greece. It's part of the European Union and it's totally dependent on mules and donkeys because there are no privately owned motor vehicles on the island. I think there's a dust cart and an ambulance, but all the transport is done using mules and donkeys. So for goods from the shops, they arrive at the, uh, at the ferry and 
mules and donkeys will take them to the supermarkets, to the small shops. Um, building materials are taken on the island. So it just shows that in the 21st century, an advanced technological society can actually um, uh, make do with you, the transport provided by animals, which is, uh, I think, very interesting. So continuing the geographical perspective, um, looking around um, the Middle East and North Africa. So these are mainly taken around the Mediterranean in Syria, in Turkey, Morocco, uh, Palestine. Uh, and OK, so moving to sub-Saharan Africa, here we can see donkeys um, in uh, West Africa, Cameroon, Chad, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, from Southern Africa. And you can see in um, South Africa there, the, uh, the donkey cart helping the broken down car. Um, and in Ethiopia, which is the um, country in Africa with the largest number of donkeys, and it's got the second largest population of donkeys in the world. Um, moving to Asia, um, donkeys are not generally um, thriving in, in the humid tropics, but they do very well in the highlands. So in countries like in Pakistan, Nepal, um, Afghanistan, um, the northern India, and in China. China um, has got the, or did have at least the largest population of donkeys in, in the world um, uh, at about 10 million. Uh, moving to uh, North America, here we have um, the mules. In the introduction, we heard a bit about the, the importance of mules in North America. Um, and uh, also there in Mexico, Mexico has got the highest donkey population in the Americas, I think the third highest in the world after China and Ethiopia. Um, moving into South America and the Caribbean, here we have um, donkeys being used for tillage in Chile and Bolivia, for riding in Colombia, pulling carts in Guyana and Nicaragua, and riding in the Dominican Republic. Donkeys are quite small, but they're sturdy and sure-footed. They're dependable and they require little maintenance. So donkeys are cheaper than oxen. They walk faster, which is good for transport, and they're less likely to be stolen. Horses are faster and stronger than donkeys, but they're more expensive and they need more attention. So the relative advantage of donkeys is that they tend to be used for small scale agriculture and small scale transport, often on a part time basis. Mules, on the other hand, tend to be stronger and more expensive than donkeys and tend to be used daily for income generation. Um, looking at the different roles uh, of donkeys, one of the major roles that we've mentioned is the, is the, the packing carrying they can be um, special pack saddles or they can loads can be just carried on the back and here we have in Azerbaijan, Cape Verde, Ethiopia, Honduras, um, Ecuador um, different examples of uh, donkeys being used just to carry things on their back. Donkeys are also used for riding in some countries um, particularly around the Mediterranean area in Colombia um, and in parts of Africa, notably um, in, in the Sahel, or in Mauritania, where they can be used by pastoralists. Um, and, and mules are also used for riding, um, although mules are, of course, a higher status, more expensive animal. Um, a major role for donkeys is for pulling carts. Here you can see different numbers of donkeys. So we've got the kind of a single dark donkey pulling a two wheel cart in Djibouti, um, also in Ethiopia. Um, a single donkey pulling a four-wheel wagon in Bulgaria. You've got three um, donkeys pulling a cart in Nij in Mali, um, four donkeys pulling a cart in Namibia, and eight donkeys pulling a cart in, in South Africa. So different um, teams be being able to use the small size of a donkey, but multiplying it up by combining it with others. Donkeys are also used for tillage, generally for light tillage. And so as we can see here in, in Western Sahara, it's a, a simple implement. Um, and if you need more strength, you combine two donkeys or in the case of um, South Africa here, you've got six donkeys pulling implements. So therefore they can pull heavier in implements. 
donkeys are also used for weeding and um, harvesting and seeding. Um, the, the model there is of uh, Gallo-Roman harvesting equipment pushed by a mule. This was pushed along and uh, allowed the, the, the Romans um, to harvest the grains of wheat. Donkeys can also uh, be used for milling and water raising, often turning in circles, turning machinery. They can press, whether it's cider or um, pushing the oil out of olives. They can be used um, for, as I say, for raising water. And in the example from Mozambique there, that's actually puddling mud. So they're just um, mixing the mud up, for making bricks. Donkeys can use to guard flocks. If you leave a donkey in a field with a flock of sheep, then the donkeys will tend to um, attack any uh, predators like dogs or wolves that, that might come in. And donkeys are also used for breeding. We've got the very specialized um, large breeds, which were uh, the, the, here the mammoth uh, donkey from United States, which was based on a similar mammoth, a large, the, the Pitois um, donkey in, in France, used for breeding large mules. There are many donkey traditions, um, and the donkeys figure in many cultural um, writings, including in Judeo Christian and Islamic texts, um, notably the Bible stories of. of riding on, on donkeys. And in many countries, there are sayings about donkeys. Many tend to be negative, saying that donkeys are stupid and stubborn and they kick and they bite, but some are very positive. In Bulgaria, when someone repeats an error, the expression is, huh, a donkey only walks on ice once. Um, donkeys are commemorated around the world in, in their harnessing. So, um, plumes and tassels on the harnesses. These are just luxuries, but it's just part of the tradition. They're, they're public statues. Here are examples of uh, statues in South Africa showing the importance of the donkey in the development of South, South Africa. Um, and and the, the, the special designs on the mules in, in France. Uh, these are all traditions. And they're um, common in um, models and toys. In fact, in the databases of various uh, museums, in, including the Henry Ford and the Museum, I, Museum of English Rural Life, a lot of the references uh, in the databases to donkeys relate to donkey toys. Donkeys have generally been regarded as low status animals compared with horses, cattle and donkeys. Sorry, um, with horses, cattle and camels. Donkey meat is only eaten in a few countries. Uh, and donkeys have been associated with poverty and donkey using people have often been considered poor and old fashioned. However, the donkeys are valuable and useful and the, the poorest people cannot afford to buy the donkey or the time to look after a donkey. And in Ethiopia, there's an expression saying, a woman without a donkey is a donkey because she then has to carry everything herself. There are gendered issues related to donkeys. In many countries and cultures, high status animals have been controlled by men, horses, camels and oxen, where the smaller, lower status animals, notably donkeys, have been allocated to women. This has actually been highly beneficial to, although it is a, a sexist um, tradition, because women have also been culturally assigned daily transport tasks such as collecting water and firewood, and which for these donkeys have been invaluable and are still invaluable. Donkeys have been increasing their range in Africa due to deforestation and lack of re rainfall. So they've been extending southwards in West Africa, coming northwards in Southern Africa. And where cattle cannot thrive due to drought, donkeys can still survive and work. So with increased climate uncertainty, donkeys may have increasing roles in small scale agriculture and transport. Donkeys can also be invaluable for delivering aid to areas devastated by disasters, whether they're climate related or other. 
motorcycles and three wheelers. So one of the main roles of donkeys has been and still is for small scale transport. In recent years, low cost motorcycles and three wheelers are taking over the niche and replacing the donkeys in many countries. So you can see here photos from Pakistan, the traditional donkey cart, or that's with pneumatic tires, the, the donkey cart there, they used to be very widespread. Now they're increasingly like the one further over, which shows the, the three wheeler being used in the same way as a donkey cart. And in the photos below, you can see um, in, in Tanzania, donkeys and motorcycles and three wheelers are being used. Donkeys are still very important for carrying things to market, but increasingly people are using um, three wheelers and motorcycles. So there has been a long history of institutional neglect of donkeys. And one of the examples of this is that they've often been omitted from the main syllabuses in veterinary and agricultural colleges. Few governments have paid attention to them or even kept statistics about them. And as low status am animals, they do not generally receive public support. There was one famous exception when Nelson Mandela came into the stadium on a national day in the donkey cart. And that was a very positive thing for donkeys. Um, another exception is the way some animal welfare organizations campaign for donkey protection. And we're going to be hearing more about this later. So welfare is an issue. Most donkeys are treated well, but there are cases of donkeys being overworked and exploited. And one of the characteristics of donkeys is that they actually can tolerate pain and they do not have a submissive um, attitude. And so that often actually provokes uh, people who are trying to uh, discipline a donkey because they don't sh cower away or show fear. And so people tend to hit them more, particularly men, I'm sad to say. But several wealth, animal welfare charities have been promoting better donkey care and moved from reactive treatments in the past to strategies for proactive prevention and education and influence at many levels. And the examples are the donkey sanctuary, we're hearing more from the Brook and Spana, and there are others. Ijiao is an expensive Chinese medicinal product made from the gelatin from donkey skins. Until about 1990, the product was mainly came from and used um, from Chinese donkeys because don China had the highest donkey population in the world, around 10 million. Then as China industrialized, its donkey population declined, but at the same time, the demand for Ijiao increased. And so Chinese traders started to pay high prices for donkey skins from around the world, leading to decimation of donkey populations, notably in Africa. We'll hear more about this in the next presentation, which is by the Donkey Sanctuary team, which has been working with the University of Reading. So how can um, agricultural museums, research bodies, NGOs, how can they highlight um, the the importance of donkeys on Don World Donkey Day or other days. Well, we can look at the diversity of the past and the present uses of donkeys. We can think about the traditional stories and the sayings and art forms involving donkeys. We can think about the diversity of equipment and exhibit the harnessing and opportun discuss opportunities for improvement. And there are projects working today to improve um, harnessing and equipment for donkeys. And we can talk about the welfare of donkeys and of the people who use donkeys, because basically it is people who are benefiting from donkeys through their use. And we can think about current issues affecting donkeys and their owners um, in the world, climate change, of course, but in particularly the HO crisis. And organizations with gift shops can get benefit from the popularity of donkeys for despite their very poor global image, donkey's toys are very popular in very many countries. And these are just a few of the um, donkey souvenirs from, from my, my collection. So thank you very much indeed, and happy World Donkey Day. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> and while we transition to Sean Edwards' presentation, from the donkey sanctuary. Uh, you can write questions in chat. 
and Barbara will be fielding those as we get into the panel discussion. So, and Sean has also pre recorded her presentation. Hello, my name is Sean Edwards. I'm the Skins campaign manager here at the Donkey Center. I've been asked to speak to you today about the donkey skin trade across the world and also to mention some of the work that we're currently doing in Africa. There's a lot of complexities to the donkey skin trade, but I'll try and outline what we're doing and our goals that we've put in place to try and end the donkey skin trade. So firstly, just a recap of why the trade exists in the first place. It's due to a Zhao, a traditional Chinese medicine used uh, to treat a range of uh, ailments um, and it contains donkey skin that's boiled, the gelatin is extracted, it's mixed with other herbs and consumables and sold very often as a slab like this to make into tea. The particular problem with the Zhao sales that happen mainly in China is that it requires about 5 million donkeys every year to keep up with the demand for a zhao. And there quite simply aren't enough donkeys in China available to meet this demand. So producers go around the globe to find the donkeys for the skin trade. Naturally, they go to where there are higher donkey populations. And these places of higher donkey populations exist because humans are dependent on their donkey herds for their livelihoods. So when donkeys are stolen or traffic or sold from these communities, it leaves the people in those communities very vulnerable, their livelihoods are at stake, and women and children very often uh, suffer particularly because they have to take up the slack and literally do the donkey work as their donkeys are no longer in their communities. So we work around the globe to protect their donkeys in the communities and also to try and disrupt the trade to stop the Ajao producers getting hold of those donkey skins. You can see from this map we work in many different countries, but looking at Africa in particular, we do have um, offices in Ethiopia and Kenya. And Kenya, for example, is a great um, way that we've been able to work with the local donkey owning communities and animal welfare groups to lobby the government to uphold the ban that's currently in place in Kenya. So that kind of work fits into our disrupt and defend side of our strategy. You could look at it like a two-sided coin and on the other side we have the product end of the market where we incentivise alternatives. We understand that the product needs to change or either needs to become less popular or the product itself has to contain something different to reduce the demand of donkey skins globally. So perhaps the Ajao producers could use other animal gelatin or they could just make their product have less donkey gelatin in it. But most excitingly, there's new developments in cellular agriculture that allows donkey gelatin to be grown in a lab. The work that we've carried out with San Paolo shows that this is scalable and we are very excited that this could be the solution to a donkey based gelatin, but it would be humane and it would be clean and it would be sustainable. Although it's a new type of technology for traditional Chinese medicine, we are very encouraged by our recent uh, YouGov studies, the first that was carried out in uh, 2020 and more recent studies that show that the buyers of Ajao, the people who want it as a medicine, would actually be quite receptive to a cellular agriculture alternative. So just to go back to the disruption side of that strategic coin, because we want to tell you about some new work that's coming out this year to protect donkeys and disrupt the trade. We've recently carried out some work with Oxford University and Wild Crew that showed the link between the donkey skin trade and cr other criminality, particularly around the smuggling of illegal wildlife items. 
quite simply, the donkey skin trade itself is being used as a carrier bag to carry out um, of the source countries other illegal items and into China. This is particularly important to us because no longer is the donkey skin trade just a donkey issue or a human livelihoods issue. It now becomes so important to many other people wanting to protect the environment and other species. So we have our first of our reports due out this spring and that's the links to the wildlife crime that I've just mentioned. Following that, we have a second report focusing on the biosecurity hazards of shipping millions of donkey skins around the world, both to human and animal health. And then our third report will be focusing on the shipping industry that's allowing the skins to be taken around the world and therefore is also allowing this criminality and the biosecurity risks to global health. As a separate report, we also have a, another report around donkey farming due out this spring. This report, Myths or Money, is using the research that we've worked with Reading University on to show that the donkey farming model simply doesn't work as a sustainable alternative. Donkey farming, sometimes suggested in countries that wish to profit from the donkey skin trade, but also recognise the hazards and risks to their country by allowing the donkey skin trade to take donkeys from their communities. Unfortunately, we've shown that donkeys quite simply don't breed at a level that is uh, required for the trade. And by saying that they are having donkey farms in countries, then all they're doing is allowing a smokescreen of holding pens for stolen and trafficked donkeys so the trade continues. This report will be due out this spring and will be widely available. So just to wrap up, I just want to have a look at those goals and our strategic outcomes that I mentioned at the beginning. Hopefully this quick uh, report of how we work in the world shows how we're taking a stand against the skin trade at various levels, be that national governments and other critical stakeholders. We're keen to use any points of leverage to disrupt, for example, the shipping industry that I mentioned briefly. And we also want to try and defend the donkeys in their countries of origin and keep them with their communities. And then finally, and quite excitingly, we're interested in this humane alternative so we can look towards a day where no donkeys are taken for the donkey skin trade at all. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed my quick presentation and my colleague Simon Pope will look forward to answering any of your questions. Wonderful, thank you. And now go ahead and stretch, just sit in your chair and move around. And Barbara will launch us into our, our panel discussion and field questions that you might have. Okay, I, I don't see any questions coming in. Um, just type to everyone and I'll see them. I'm keeping an eye on the chat. Maybe people don't know how to, you know, if you click at the bottom of the screen, there, if you hover over with your cursor, you'll see a chat icon. And if you click on that, it will bring up a box in which you can type. There's a question, okay. Shall I save the questions until we're actually in the panel though? <laughs> yeah, I can, I'm, I can answer that. Yes, yes it is. Um, um, I think, um, Australia is actually the largest uh, importer of Ajaya products, but there's a huge uh, aspiration on the part of the Ajaya industry in China to market the product internationally and particularly to North America as a cultural treasure. Uh, and we do, we are aware of a lot of Ajaya products being in, uh, imported into the US and our, uh, you know, our friends, the Brook, um, what, have actually got a congressman to take forward a bill in the US to actually ban the sale of Ajaya 
there. Uh, we, it is on sale in the UK. You can find it if you know what you're looking for. And I mean, if I were to wander into a TCM shop in, in Soho, I get the response, no, we don't sell it. But we have had Asian investigators who go in and yes, it is available. Um, so it, and I think that it's, um, it's status in the UK, uh, is, is different because in China, it is emphatically a medicine it's, it's, it's always been recognized as being a medicine outside China. Uh, it's, it's a remedy or it's a tonic or it's a food supplement. Uh, so, I mean, that's another issue. So the, the claims that are being made for it as a product in China are very different to where it's being described elsewhere, which is something we want to look at at the moment. Um, but yes, it is, it is available outside China and we're just starting to see signs now of actually it being produced in Africa itself. Um, so mm -hmm. that's, you know, you must have that sort of vertical integration where it's being, where donkeys being slaughtered and first stage of Jiao is also being manufactured there, which is a new thing. And of course, then that stops the whole issues and the problems about actually exporting skins all around the world so it's, it's it's very much an industry which is still developing and finding ways to operate and produce and develop it's not static at all it's, it's in a constant state of flux thank you maybe we should start the panel with um bertha mudamburi and uh, giving a few words about her work and where she is. Do you agree, Deb? Deb's not here. Yes, that, that's wonderful. Okay. Go ahead, Bertha. Do you have any, introduce yourself to, to, the, to all of us? And um, there are a couple of questions coming in now. And as soon as we have the three panelists, um, we, can, we can get going with the questions. Thank you, Barbara. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Namibia. My name is Beth Amdamburi, and I'm working for the University of Namibia at a campus called Ogongo in the northern parts of Namibia. I, part of my work uh, as a lecturer, uh, or oh, one of the modules that I teach is the farm power and machinery, and it involves the teaching draft animal power. So through my interactions with the students, I have managed to discuss with students on uh, their thoughts, their views about draft animal power and uh, particularly donkeys. And the students always um, highlight that they view draft animal power as a, an environment, environmentally friendly practice. Mm -hmm. They also think that it's affordable to the smallholder farmers and the timeliness of operations. And also most communities here in Namibia uh, use draft animal power for carrying water. I always feel sorry for women and children around the communities who walk long distances to collect water. So with donkeys, they are able to collect the water. They are also able to carry produce and uh, a food when they are coming from grinding meals or from the fields. Uh, part of my work has also been with the Minister of Agriculture here in Namibia and also in Zimbabwe. I have had an opportunity to interact widely with various colleagues in animal traction networks in Zimbabwe, Namibia, and also the Eastern and Southern African network. So, in my work as well as a researcher, I've done some work using donkeys, pulling uh, various implements for land preparation. And they found out that the donkeys can effectively work uh, in land preparation uh, operations when used well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Bertha. Deb, do you want to change the view or should we just uh, assume that everyone knows that Paul and Bertha and Simon Pope are the panel and we can keep asking questions? Yes, yes, okay. I think this view, the gallery view is fine. And okay. I think Bertha's comments about the machinery is wonderful because it yes. puts the three of the topics and the goals together. Right. 
So a couple of the questions that have come in seem to have been kind of addressed obliquely already. One question was whether um, we could actively promote donkey use as an alternative climate friendly transport mode and Bertha mentioned that a little bit. Did anybody else want to comment on that idea of using the climate change impact as a, a fulcrum for donkey use? So certainly, the, uh, the, the the donkey um, uh, obviously it's not using fossil fuels. Um, it's using um, low quality forage from around the place. So it is a very environmentally friendly means of transport. Okay. Yes, it is. Um, Catherine asked, uh, it, "Is the donkey sanctuary advocating at the political level to have nations stop importing donkey skins?" For instance, getting the Australian government to ban its importation, and Simon mentioned that the U.S. is, is there are efforts in the U.S. about that. How about in other countries? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I think our focus has been uh, primarily in actually getting countries to stop the tr stop the uh, at the source end. So you know, the focus has very much been on countries like Kenya, like Tanzania, which were initially involved in the trade. Uh, lobbying those governments, acting, amplifying the voices of donkey dependent communities, being able to speak to the government about how important they are as livelihood assets. Um, and that has been, uh, that has worked well so far. And in a sense, what we've done is sort of focused on that rather than stop the other end, which of course is actually the countries importing it. But it's just, that's a tactical um but it's a tactical thing, really, because if we can get, we believe anyway, we can get more leverage at that end. It is, certainly is something we're going to look at in the future. We've, uh, Sean alluded to in her uh, presentation that we're getting a lot of, we're doing a lot of work on cellular agriculture, looking at um, lab grown collagen, lab, you know, lab grown um, uh, humane alternatives to, uh, to, to that. And, and in that instance, of course, there's no reason why a giant shouldn't be allowed to continue to be sold because it's, it's not be, it's not dependent on the slaughter of millions of donkeys every year. Um, but I mean, just to your second point, you'd asked that issue about biosecurity. Watch out for report two, which is coming out later this year. Some of the things that we have found out about the biosecurity risks inherent in the trade are absolutely terrifying. Mm. Uh, I mean, we all know, um, you know, the 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 how. Um, uh, you know, COVID, you know, began as a as a, an animal to human transmission. Uh, we've done testing on skins that were literally waiting to be shipped to China, uh, and there are things in there which, if they uh, were, um, you know, if, if they if they did infect equine populations in China, would be disastrous. Uh, we've got to be very careful about how we represent that because obviously we don't want to cry wolf or we don't want to. You know, act as scaremongers, um, but but the biosecurity issues are huge. As are the um, the toxins and things. That, there's a lot of things in a jar which shouldn't be in there. There's a lot of things that should be in there that aren't. But the, mm -hmm. the reverse is also true. Uh, so from a um, uh, from a from a biosecurity point of view, in terms of the end product. Uh, that end product is not this clean, wholesome um, tonic that the, that is being made out to be. It, it, it's it's uh, it's it's a dirty product, and uh, the the industry can have a no way of being able to establish or be certain about the source of that and how it was produced. Uh, Stephen has asked: Is there any evidence that donkeys are being better treated because their value has gone up? Um, as a, as a demand for Ejow is, I don't know if one of you can comment on that. Donkeys are more valuable probably. And I, I think that the, the, the donkeys are more valuable, but I think that the big risk is theft. Yeah, and and, um, and there have also been some sad cases of uh, the men of the household saying, we're gonna sell them because you can cash in and get $500 for a donkey. And yeah. so leaving the women who were actually the main beneficiaries of the donkeys. Yeah, so uh, I, I think, um, the, the it's 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 a tra tragedy um, where you know the, the the market is there and one of the reasons why people used to use donkeys rather than oxen is, is because they were less, less likely to be stolen now mm -hmm. they're in some ways more likely to be stolen right, right. if if there is an outlet in the country yes if there's okay 
Um, Stephen is also asked, is there an accessible map of donkey slaughterhouses and their status, e.g. open, shut, challenged? Um, yeah, good, again, good, good question. I'd say probably 80% of the slaughterhouses are illegal ones. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the majority of the legal ones, if you like, which were in places like uh, Kenya and Tanzania have, have been closed or they've not been licensed by the authorities. Um, what we're seeing now actually is a shift away from Africa as the source country for source continent, sorry, for um, donkeys because donkeys have been depleted to such an extent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the source, the main source continent now is South America and Latin America, Central America as well, actually. Um, so, uh, and there, there are licensed slaughterhouses there, particularly a large number in Peru. Uh, and Brazil, although recently the ones in Brazil have uh, also been uh, closed down by the authorities. So, you know, we, again, again, this goes back to what I was saying before. Literally a week doesn't go by without there being some development, which is good in a sense. Uh, but sla illegal pop slaughterhouses will pop up. The authorities will close them down. Legal ones will pop up in another country. Uh, but if you look at our report, you'll get a pretty good idea about where the main source countries are for donkey skins at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Deb and Paul, um, I see that some, some Dr. Dr. Yemez from Turkey has said if, he, uh, if we have enough time, he would like to give a short presentation about five minutes on donkeys from Turkey. Do we have time for that or can that be arranged? I don't know if Deb is still with us or not. I'm not sure how that would be accomplished you know, technically. I, I think um, it's, it sounds a very nice idea, but it may be something that we can um, leave for the next time because hopefully we'll be doing something next year. Um, and so we can uh, plan that in, into, the, in, into the, the next year's planning. And mm -hmm. I, I think that there's quite a lot of interest in networking relating to donkeys. And so we, we could get, get together on, on, on a separate occasion. Um, I've got no objection though. Um, uh, it's just that it's the, the, the Zoom technology can be often be difficult in, in, in cases like that. Yes, we are planning to keep the Zoom meeting open for a few minutes after 10 o'clock. Maybe that would be a time when at least um, people could talk about their own experiences and share, even if not a whole presentation, at least some, some ideas. Yes, and I would say we, we very much want to hear about your work with Turkey. So yeah. We, yeah, at the at the hour, this will officially close. We have approximately 15 minutes for these additional conversations and future planning. And that's perfect. Yes, I um, Simon mentions we're seeing donkeys in the skin trade coming from Turkey as well. What I'm what I'm interested in is what happens to the carcasses. And perhaps you each address this, but I, I didn't catch it. Does anybody know what happens to the carcasses? Do they get used for? From, from the skin, uh, as a consequence of the skin trade? Yes. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 there's a token effort to um, do make um, money out of the meat. But to be honest, it's it's almost as though, it's almost the reverse is true. The, the the meat is almost a byproduct of the skin trade because the skin is what's valuable. Mm -hmm. So the meat, I mean, certainly in uh, Kenya, they were feeding it to a local crocodile farm. Um, in um, in a number of cases, certainly when I was there three or four years ago, they were literally just dumping it in huge pits in the ground. Um, and we've got videos of. of trucks just tipping the awful um you know everything slurry you know it just just into huge pits um in some parts of africa there is a uh there is a market for them for the meat which is very small um from for cultural purposes actually in in namibia but also in um uh, in Kenya as well, but I mean it's negligible. I mean, it's, no one's going to make themselves a fortune out of the uh, out of the meat there. So it's um, some market in in the Far East, but as you can imagine, you know, freezing it, packaging it up, sending it in a refrigerated container half around the world. By the time it's got, it's, it's not really worth anything. So um, often. 
the traders have to go through the process of looking like there is a market for the meat because that's the basis on which the slaughterhouses are licensed. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But there, there's no other, it's, it's a negligible negligible value, really. Mm -hmm. um, sorry to interrupt you, um, or could I just add to what Simon said? Um, I interviewed donkey butchers in northern Ghana for my doctorate a couple of years ago, and I've just subbed my thesis in. And actually, the um, hide trade seemed to be piggybacking on the back of the meat trade mm -hmm. in Ghana, um, because they used to throw the skins away. And now that then they found some Chinese middlemen coming to buy the skins. Sadly, um, it, there was one community I interviewed which didn't eat donkey meat and one community I interviewed where they did. And the donkey butchers and the community both were telling me that the um, consumption of donkey meat was going up. Um, they gave me various reasons for that. Um, they smoke the meat because of the refrigeration problems that Simon's just mentioned. Um, but they've had a growing market in Kumasi in southern um, Ghana. And both that market and the local market, it's increasing. They uh, also more fashionable in one of the communities was donkey intestine soup. <laughs> Um, and that's something that both people who don't own donkeys and people who do own donkeys can make money out, women, for example. Um, so it seems that because donkeys were used to be slaughtered at the end of their productive life when the meat wasn't mm -hmm. to eat, but now, because, also because of the, the donkey hide trade, because they're being slaughtered early, they are beginning to eat. And I can't work out which is the chicken and which is the egg. Mm -hmm. um, but there did seem in northern Ghana, which is obviously a very specific situation, the meat actually in consumption is increasing and the hides is actually on the back of that. The hides trade is on the back of that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, th this is fantastic information across the globe. And it's for an agricultural museum perspective, a curator, you realize that there's a topic that many museums have never even addressed yes. that is not only essential historically, but must be addressed in the context of the you know, 20th and 21st century change. And, it, 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 and these kinds of conversations are invaluable to doing that. Yes. Hopefully this is the first of several that we May can I regularly talk? schedule. Yeah. May I talk, please? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Hello, everybody uh, from Turkey. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry for my bad English uh, pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. It's not, it is not my mother tongue. Uh, I would like to celebrate uh, Mother's Day today, also Donkey Day. Uh, both of them are uh, very important for us. Uh, Simon Pope uh, wrote something about uh, skin trade from Turkey. I never heard, but it may be. I don't have an idea, but uh, I would like to see some evidence, some documents, and it is very, very important because it is nasty. It is nasty. Uh, I am the only scientist who search donkey in Turkey. There is no more, just me. For 10 years, I traveled uh, all about Turkey, about, uh, we have 81 provinces, provinces. Uh, and uh, I never heard that, but uh, if there is some trade, uh, Simon, please, I would, I would like to know them and uh, I will, inform the government to stop that because it is a nasty trade. It cannot be acceptable. Okay, finish, over. Thank you. We have come to the hour. So I believe we should conclude the formal portion and I will stop the recording and I'll do that after I make the next comment, <laughs> that we will stay for 15 minutes more. And then during that unrecorded time, because we care about privacy, if you want to share emails in the chat, we can do that. But I wanna make sure that the recording is off before we do that. 
Otherwise, the only person that that has your contact information is the the social media coordinator for IEMA, and we are very careful to take care of your privacy and your information. So with that housekeeping issue, thank you so much for participating. And uh, thank you for your work with donkeys in many regions and countries. And this is the start hopefully of a continuing conversation. And I'm, I'm going to tend to turning the recording off and allowing us 15 minutes of, of peaceful conversation.